Alrighty, so this is a, a new topic for us, the first time we've talked about it, but I think it's a neat one in the sense that uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there for land managers, landowners, to kind of util take, take advantage of the ubiquitous, ubiquitous nature of uh, smartphones and tablets, because there really is a lot of uh, good things out there uh, available for landowners to use. So if you're out there and you really want to get all this good information and you really wanted to have all your resources at your fingertips and to go out on, on, on your land, you know, historically you had to carry all this stuff. Forest measurements, tree ID books, bird ID books, notebooks, compasses, maps, everything, right? And so that would wear you out carrying through the woods. The nice thing about smartphones and tablets is that all of that fits on one little thing now, right? Just with all these different apps. So it gives you uh, the world at your fingertips, an ability to kind of have all this and not have a backpack full of junk trying to get out into the woods. So that's one of the reasons I like it. So what we're wanting to do today is kind of start with just some considerations uh, when choosing apps, things to think about um, when you decide whether you, you want to put them on your, your, your tablet or not, and then get into these different apps. And we kind of lump them into three categories. Uh, identification, field guide type apps, calculations, information, recommendation type apps, and then mapping apps. So I'm going to talk about the first two, and then Kevin, who's more of a mapping expert than I am, is going to kind of finish up with some of these different mapping apps. And then if we have time at the end, definitely take questions. I've got my tablet here. If people want to do a little show and tell and look at some of these apps, we can do that as well. Alrighty, some considerations when you're looking at these apps. The big one is basically what operating system you're using with your tablet or phone, whether it's an Android or iOS, and whether these apps have availability in there. Um, also the origin of these apps. When looking at this and finding apps, I saw an awesome app and put it on my phone and I realized it was from New Zealand. Right? I was like, oh, well, that's probably a little different than what I want. So figure out, is it for your area? Is it, is it designed for the species that you're dealing with, the soil that you're dealing with, the area? That's important because these apps and the app stores are worldwide. Um, your data needs. Some of these apps are large. Um, it takes up the storage on your phone. Sometimes you need to use data, or some of them you're available to use them while you're offline. So you can download them that way. So just kind of, when you're looking at these apps and trying to decide, figure out, do you need this app to be able to work offline, or, do you, or can you use data where you're at? How big of a storage it is? What's the current, current support? Is it a great app, but the last time it was updated was 2011? That might not be the best app. It may not be able to work for you. So again, kind of do your homework, look at these apps, and figure out, is it something that's going to work for you in your current situation? Uh, some other things to think about is the battery life of your device. Some of these apps, particularly mapping apps that kind of keep the, the, uh, keep the device cranking the whole time, really wears out your batteries. So you can either uh, get a long-lived battery device or some of these external portable battery chargers to kind of keep it going if you're going to plan to use this all day. Uh, storage capacity, some of these field guys particularly have a lot of pictures available with them. Some have audio with them or videos. Um, SD external cards, do you have the capacity to hold that into your, in, your, in your device? And then especially ruggedized devices. So if you go out there and I have some broken phones to prove it, if you don't have some ability to protect that, ruggedize it, make it a little waterproof or weatherproof, uh, you're going to end up messing up your devices walking around in the woods. There's nothing worse than a, a branch smacking the screen of your tablet, right, when you're walking. So just a few things. Uh, there's a bunch of apps out there. There's a lot of things available. We looked at a lot of them, so we're, again, we're just going to kind of hit the high points and just cover a few of these that I think may be worthwhile considering. Uh, jumping into these identification field guide apps, uh, a big one is uh, the, the Wildflower series. So if you're interested in plant identification, uh, we use... Uh, Illinois wildflowers where we're at. There's also the same company makes an Iowa wildflowers, a Wisconsin wildflowers. They make them in iOS and Android. And this is a nice, uh, a nice guide to cover your bases on many of the common plants and to and kind of pick them out. So I like having this if I'm ever stumped by a plant. This is a good place to start. It, it says wildflowers, but it covers forbs, trees, shrubs, grasses, ferns. It covers a big area. And, you know, the nice thing is it has characteristics. It's not just leafing through. You can actually choose and select different characteristics you see on the plant, and it narrows it down for you so you kind of help you select it. Good information with maps, photos, uh, write-ups about these plants, and kind of the way it works. Um, so there's the maps and everything. The way it works, so if you have this front page, 
and it has all this information. It says right now it, it has 3,400 plants in there. But you can choose all these different categories. You can narrow it down by flower color, what type of plant it is, the number of petals, where it grows. And as you do that, it narrows and narrows down the plants that kind of meet what you've selected until you have a reasonable number. So if I selected a wildflower, it went from, it went from 34 to 1,800, right? If I added a, a white flowering wildflower, it's down to 800 plants. One that has four petals, it's down to 160 plants. One that has alternate leaves, we're down to 70 plants. And then it grows in the forest, we're down to 55 plants, right? So you just really, pretty simple, basic characteristics, just by clicking on those, you can really kind of reduce your options. And the 55 plants is enough basically to click on it and scroll through them and see the plant that, uh, that looks like what you're looking at. Again, it's me, it's, it's a really effective uh, app that stays on your phone. You don't have to use the data and it, um, it kind of helps pick the people that are just learning to identify wildflowers. There's a bunch of different tree ones. One of the ones I downloaded was called Tree Book. It has a smaller set. There's only 100 species, and it's only for, for Apple. But there's several other ones out there. And again, it's kind of the same thing where it has guides. You can get on there and choose whether it's broad leaves or needles, uh, compound, simple leaves, opposite, alternate. And again, it kind of narrows it down for you to a, a subset of species. So tree book's a nice one. Again, there's a bunch of different tree guides. Uh, there's some that cost, this is a free one. There's some that cost like two bucks uh, that are pretty nice as well. So they're just um, kind of shop around and see which one that you like the best, which one works best for you. But that's a decent one. Um, for pests, if you're looking at tree health or forest health issues and you have an insect issue and you're not sure what it is, this is a great reference to have. It's a photographic reference of the pest of the Eastern United States or actually all the North America, and it covers beetles, um, lepidopterans, moths, caterpillars, wasps, all the different basically tree-feeding pests. And it's a great, uh, again, just a picture guide to start. So you can go in there, you find pictures, you can go from the pictures, you can click on information, and then it has a lot of information about the pest, the host that they're on, kind of their life cycle and their range. And really it's just a reference book that you can have with you um, to kind of help pick out and figure out what's wrong with your tree. It's a nice one to have on there. Um, one that I really use a lot um, is Audubon Birds. If you're interested in kind of figuring out what birds you have on your land or tracking the birds or, or finding them, this is a nice one because you can download it. It's a, it's, a, it's a data hog. It takes a lot of space on your tablet or your, your phone, but it has tons of pictures. It has calls, maps, information for all the species. Um, in, in the North America, and it's a really good reference and a way to find this stuff. If you want to compile and track and save your, your sightings, it's another way to do that. But, but um, to me, I use this one probably more than anything else. I don't really carry around bird field guides for birds anymore because I have this on my phone. I can listen to the calls right away. Um, it's got, you can search by type of plant, uh, bird, or you can search by um, the name of the bird. You can scroll through them. It has their range maps in there, their voices, their calls. Again, it's a really great reference just for people to have handy if you're trying to figure out what the birds are that you're seeing on your land. But probably in terms of identification, my favorite app I think I have for identification and for tracking things is iNaturalist. Has anybody ever use iNaturalist? One. Oh, we got one person. Awesome. So iNaturalist, is, it's, it's an ID, but it, it's, um, it's more than that. It lets you actually go in and take pictures of any living organism. It could be insects, spiders, plants, mosses, you name it. You can take a picture of it and it puts it in this database. And it keeps track of what you've seen, what other people have seen, and then it actually helps you identify them. And that's the neat thing. It kind of has this ability to suggest what they, it thinks that your picture, it takes your picture and compares it to other pictures in the database and says, well, I think it's this. And then actually other experts that are on this site can verify, yes, you're right on your identification, or no, I think it's this. So it has this ability of interacting with other experts in your area or, or people that are just interested in it and kind of helping you to figure out what this plant is or the species is. So this one, even if you don't know what you've got, taking a picture and putting it on this uh, system is a great way to kind of start learning and then cataloging and mapping what you have on your land. That's used a lot. There's hundreds of thousands of points all throughout the Midwest into this database. 
Um, go on there, there's information about them, tons of different pictures, and then maps. So I, uh, and other thing it lets me do, and so these are my, re these are some of my observations from uh, our, my land, and you can go on there and it catalogs everything you've seen, when you've seen them, where it's at, and you can put it on a map. You can go in there and look at the database and look at the map and find out where all these species are and where you've seen them before. Not only you, but where other people have seen them and add that into there. But the, kind of the coolest thing is, if you think you have something out there, you can click that observe button and go take a picture. So I took this picture a couple days ago, and then it gives you, ask you questions, you know, about it or whatever. But the nice thing, nice thing is down there it says suggestions. So even if I did not know what this plant was, you can click that view suggestions button, and it says, I'm pretty sure it's in the, the conifer group, and my number one suggestion is eastern red cedar. So just by that picture, the, the, the iNaturals program identified that as eastern red cedar. And every time I've used this, even with really lousy pictures, what the plant actually is is always in the top one or two. So it does a fantastic job, even with just twig pictures of leaf off pictures of hardwoods. It does a good job of identifying what this is. So to me, it's probably the, the best single app for identifying unknown species. Now, in terms of calculations, information, some other apps that just give you good information at your, on your, at your hands, um, there's one from the Forest Service, it's called the Service Foresters Toolkit, and they basically took the old toolkit uh, publication and then made it into an app, and it really has tons of information about forestry, calculations, forestry measurements, spacings, uh, site indices, all this information is right there kind of at your fingertips and you can have it in the field to reference. Um, lots of good information in there. They can do some basic calculations as well. And again, it's all kind of right at your fingertips, which is nice. You can get uh, seed tree spacings, minimum recommended number of seed trees. You can go in there and select the area you live in and it'll give you site index for different species. Um, in there, it'll give you estimates of what, of growth rate estimates, a lot of good information in there. Um, so there's some white oaks site index for southern Illinois. Again, a lot of good information in this for uh, the forestry toolkit here. And it's, it's good data, it's been data there for a long time, it's been available, but this puts it in an easy to use format that's available with you. Uh, stocking charts, kind of everything's put into this, uh, into this app. I, I, I like it, I think it's a really handy resource that you can just refer back to when you're in the field. Uh, another one is SoilWeb. We use this a lot because it basically uses the GPS that's on your device or on your phone, and it'll tell you basically the soil that you're standing on, right? So you can check where you're at and the soil types and get that, that, those soil classifications and that information for you right there, which is really nice if you just to double check and make sure that you know what soil you're at. Uh, it's, it's a handy thing. It's kind of tied into NRCS's soil web and their, their digi digitizing of all their soil data. It's just an easy way to use the GPS on your phone to find out what's right by you. Um, if you're interested in prescribed fire, there's a few out there that calculates the prescribed fire weather. You put in some basic information, temperature and wind speed, and it'll calculate for you kind of what the fire weather is, uh, smoke index potential, and all these things in there. So you can kind of use it as an easy way to track um, whether it's a good day to burn or not, whether it's going to get better over time uh, that day. And you can actually input that data and store it so you can kind of keep track of your fires and so you know all that weather data for that fire is stored on your phone so you can have that if you need to recall it later or send in a report. Pretty nice, um, just a good, you know, a good tool to have to keeping that data on hand, to keep kind of cataloging that. You can record every time you check the weather course uh, through the course of the day, you can store it in there and that just lets you have that information at your hand so you don't have to write it down or remember it um, while you're doing other stuff with the fire. There's another one similar that, that calculates your um, relative humidity for your fire. There's, there's a lot of good fire apps, but this is a neat one. Uh, there's a couple in here that I haven't used. These are a little more, little more ag-centric ones, but um, if you're doing broadcast spraying or some other large applications, uh, for herbicides, these are pretty good. There's a Mix My Sprayer, it's from Clemson University, and they have another one called Calibrate My Sprayer. And they're both, um, again, they're more of an ag base, but they could be useful for um, anybody to kind of use um, for, for, you know, for larger sprays, even in a forestry setting or a natural setting. 
again, it's just to kind of verify how to do these things and make sure your math's right and know it. So they're, they're kind of handy for that. And then those are the basic ones, and I'm going to pass it on over to Kevin for the mapping stuff. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to go over a few more uh, specific to um, mapping. Uh, the first one up is Avenza Maps. And I've just been seeing a lot more people make use of this application, um, professionals and lay people alike. Uh, it makes use of geo-referenced PDF files. Um, so you can acquire these PDF files from any number of sources. Um, the app itself has its own map store. Uh, it has um, a whole variety of base maps that you can use from the map store. Some are free. Uh, some cost a few dollars for um, some specific base maps. Um, you can use, um, maybe you have a forest management plan map uh, that somebody has put together for you. Uh, pretty, pretty much every time those are going to be geo-referenced. So um, this app can be most useful, I think, for navigation and locating yourself and property boundaries. Uh, stand boundaries, that sort of thing. Um, but you can also capture uh, points and capture your GPS tracks with this. Um, and then you can download that data uh, in a few different file formats from KML, GPX, which is the GPS locations, and CSV files. Um, another cool thing about this, you can capture photos along with your points. So if you're taking a picture of a specific tree or a, a problem area or something like that. You can capture a photo and then it's linked up to that GPS point. Um, and actually if you have uh, old photos that maybe you did not uh, capture a GPS point to, uh, but you have a picture on your phone, you can uh, use this app. Uh, it has an option to plot photos there. So like yesterday, I took a picture of the old historic fort right outside here, and um, just uh, you click on that photo uh, after you go to plot photos, and it sets a place mark uh, right there where where you found it. Uh, so this is just an example of like a, a forest management plan map that might have been developed um, by your forester, um, and so I guess I I should also back up. Um, when you're looking at these PDF maps, uh, it also shows your location by uh, that little blue dot on there. Um, so that way as you're moving across the map, you can see where you're located. So let's say you're walking through your, your land and you want to know uh, if you've stepped into another stand or not. Sometimes that's pretty obvious, but other times maybe not. Um, so your little blue dot will show up where you're, where you're at on the map and you can see um, just where the transitions are. Uh, this next one is a little different. This is a, a database app. Um, it actually links up to a, a website, the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. Has anyone ever heard of that one? Just one? Um, so this is a, an online database of invasive species. And so um, anyone can go to the, the website itself and enter uh, locations and species information uh, for invasives, um, but they created a series of apps actually and they're, they're linked up to this website so you can actually take uh, down invasive species uh, information in the field and then it links back up to that uh, online database which is pretty cool and so you can refer back to it um, at any time you can see what other people have entered, so you can see uh, distribution maps um, all across the country. Um, there's a lot of really good information in addition to the ability to uh, collect um, location information, so it has um, a lot of species descriptions, uh, photos if you're having uh, trouble trying to ID a particular invasive. It's not just plants. Uh, I tend to focus on plants because that's what we do most of, 
uh, with, um, but any sort of invasive, invasive insects, a lot of, uh, of those um, are very important as well. So here's a couple of um, captures of the kind of info that is available. So it has the species descriptions and, like I said, the, um, some really high quality photos. Um, so when you go to report and observation, it has just a, a series of um, drop-down menus, more or less, that you enter in, and then uh, as soon as you um, report your um, your sighting, it links back up to the EdMaps database. Uh, an expert will confirm or deny <laughs> your report just to make sure all the data is good, and. After that, it will be loaded into the national database. So that uh, image on the right is sort of one of the outputs that you can uh, take a look at for concentrations of uh, recorded observations of different species. So you can see where certain hot spots are, and that goes down into a much finer scale than, than what you see there as well. Uh, this last one um, might not be as accessible uh, to landowners, uh, but a lot of land managers are making use of this. This is the collector app for ArcGIS. Um, so in order to capitalize on this, the, the app itself is free uh, for anyone. Um, but to really make full use of it, you need to have an organizational account in and an, and ArcGIS Online and also um, some ability to use uh, ArcGIS Desktop as well so that you can actually create uh, these schemas and, and map documents, which would then be uploaded to online and available uh, through the app on your phone. So um, we've been using these in southern Illinois for uh, invasive species and forest management databases, and we're having some uh, success with that. The really neat thing about this is that um, once that's uploaded into this online database, again, it's shareable across agencies and organizations. So um, one example uh, that we have is we put together a, a basic database for uh, bush honeysuckle uh, roadside surveys. And we made it pretty simple so that we could uh, collect the data while we're driving down the road. You just have to tap a few buttons for each location that we found it. Um, and we did this across eight priority landscapes uh, within the region. So we just split up into a couple, uh, several teams of two and uh, drove all the roads within these priority landscapes and the, the passenger would just uh, tap those few buttons every time we saw a bush honeysuckle uh, and came up with some really great information. Uh, so the, the map on the left is sort of the regional map um, and the, the priority landscapes, there were four on kind of each side of the national forest down there. And then the, the two um, maps on the right are two of these priority landscape clusters that we call them. And you can see the, the concentration of bush honeysuckle is very different between uh, those two areas. So we're working on compiling that data and, and uh, we think it's gonna be really handy for management going forward. And that's all we have for the formal uh, presentation. Any questions out there? Yeah, pretty much everything we talked about today is available on the Play Store. And actually, all of these are free apps. There's other costly ones, but we try to focus just on the free ones. So the question is, what app would you use for invasive species shrubs in a forest to map well, them, or, or what are you looking for? To identify. To identify them? Um, that EdMaps Midwest app that, that Kevin showed, not only can you track the information and put points out there, but it has basically field guides built in. So if you can see it, what it is, you can do that. Uh, the other neat thing about that is once you enter data, like Kevin said, is there's an expert in that state that's gonna get an email every time you enter data and they'll look at your picture and if it's incorrect, they'll let you know and they'll change it or if it's right, they'll verify it. So there's an expert verifier for all of that data, which is nice. Does it tell you if it's invasive species? That one doesn't, that one's just for invasive species. If you don't know what it is and you just want to identify it, that iNaturalist app is a really good one because you just take a picture of it and the iNaturalist app will suggest what it is. Yeah. And then you have to kind of follow up and do some research. Are you charged for 
county maps online um, in Iowa. I'm not sure. Sometimes uh, counties charge for um, mapping data and some don't. Um, we put together some uh, county level property ownership maps and had to get special permission. You really probably have to contact the county itself um, or look at the website, it might tell you. Uh, and as far as the legal description, they just have to say that in case something's wrong. Um, they don't want to be responsible. So legally, you would want a, a surveyor to go out and, and verify those boundaries. Yeah, in most cases, it is accurate. But again, they don't want to run into a problem. No. So. Um, the way they work is when you collect the data, it's on your phone. So it stays on your phone until you get to a point where either you want to use your data or you get to Wi-Fi and then you upload it to the cloud. So the actual ultimate storage of this is cloud-based, so it doesn't, it does, it's not stored on your phone, but it has to be stored temporarily unless you want to use your data to upload it every time. What I do typically is just collect a bunch of information and then when I get back to Wi-Fi where I don't use data. I upload it all at once. So there is a temporary storage on your phone, but most of it's cloud. So if you've got a file, though, I mean, if you change phones or lose it or trash it, you can always regain your, it's your account. It's an account. It's a sign-in account is how it works. So yeah, so your account is stored up there so you can access it. And I've got it on my phone and my tablet so I can access it from multiple devices. And it's the same data. OK. So you mentioned that Audubon books, for example, took up a lot of data. It does, so they're, they're buried. So the ones that the ones that store those pictures and information on your phone take a lot of data. I can't remember what it is right now, but it's you know I think the, the biggest one was definitely the Audubon one because it has 700 birds in it and all this stuff. So it was half a gig or something like that. Yeah. It, was, it was quite a bit of data. Um, you know you have the option for that one that you don't have to store it on your phone. You can download it and then that data is called. That, that information is called in when you select it, but it takes data every time you do that. So I store it on my phone so I don't have to use my data all the time. Uh, but it is, it's definitely the biggest one in terms of storage. The other ones aren't as much, um, you know, because there's relatively fewer species and fewer pictures. But definitely the Audubon one is the most uh, storage hungry. Yeah, if you have an Android too, you can use your um, SD card as well to store some of that data. Yeah, so the, the question is about the accuracy of the GPS location and then also uh, using the mapping apps in uh, areas with topography. Um, the GPS location can vary significantly depending on your device. Um, some devices have much higher quality built-in GPS receivers. Um, things like uh, probably the uh, Apple tablets and the higher end Samsung tablets have much better GPS receivers than um, maybe some cheaper uh, smartphones. Um, and then the topography can influence um, your uh, accuracy of your locations for sure. Um, it all depends on how many satellites you have if you're using the built in GPS receiver. Some phones actually only use like your device location um, based on cell towers signals, and that would be a, a significant issue um, if you don't have a device without a GPS receiver. But typically, like uh, with my tablet here, it has a built-in GPS receiver and even pretty heavy forest cover. So I'm not sure to set just for a minute, but I get plus or minus 14 feet. So you know that point is within 14 feet or so of whatever what I think it is, right? So that's about as accurate. So you're not going to do surveying and get exact lines, but it will get you pretty close to the vicinity. Again, it, sometimes sometimes if it's in really tough, you know, steep canyon or something, you'll have issues. But it's pretty good. Any of your favorite phones for durability and waterproofing? Uh, the question is, any favorite phones? Uh, no. <laughs> so we don't really recommend one product product over another. My big, biggest recommendation was get a good ruggedized case for whatever you get. That's probably the best thing to do. 
Um, USNG? I'm not sure actually what coordinate system it uses. Whatever that is. Yeah, and I, I don't know if there's an ability to switch that or not. There's a there's an Avast free version, which is the one we've been using, and there's an Avast Pro also. They might have additional capabilities like that. But I think it I think it typically outputs just in decimal degrees. It's what it gives mm -hmm. you you save stuff and you can catalog and find them that long. That, but I'm not I think that's the one that's the fault. I don't know if you can change it to ETMs or some other system though. No, I don't. It doesn't. I don't. So there's two different things. You can have both there. The the level that it, it serves for course that the toolkit gets is you can kind of get by general region, and then you can input some additional data to get more accurate than that. But I don't think it connects, so it doesn't find out exactly where you're standing and what soil type you're in. I just I didn't, I didn't have that in find ability to do that. <laughs> 